This is the story of how one man's filth was another man's revelation. With the help of some daring scientists, one magic pill would end up saving billions of lives. What's going on, everyone? And welcome to our new show, In the Name of Science. We're your hosts, Chris Howard. Josh Jacobs. And Eddie Fernandez. You always wait. You always wait. It's always got to be about Eddie. Why does it always have to be about you? I mean, what is the one difference that you see between me and the two of you on the screen? You have hair? A luxurious head of it. It is. So? Bald is beautiful. Bald is beautiful, but so is Harry. Are you kidding me? You put Chewbacca next to me. Looks like the dude has alopecia. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing how penicillin was discovered. Uh, I'm sure many of you out there born around the same time as Josh and myself were, are well acquainted with penicillin. Eddie was probably still in diapers when we were in middle school, but hey. I'm sure he's in diapers right now. I am, and I just sharded myself. <laughs> but there are just as many of you that don't even think about it anymore. Instead, it's just something that's around to stop you from getting sick. According to Wikipedia, penicillin is a group of antibiotics originally obtained from penicillium moles. Josh had to like really tell me, like, correct me on how I said penicillium. Yeah, you did great. Fantastic. Uh, didn't they give out penicillin when you got an STD? I didn't get an STD. <laughs> you racist. Wait. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't say anything. <laughs> you would pick out the Cuban. What? I just asked. <laughs> Eddie assumes. Yeah. I, you know, when you make, when you assume, Eddie, what do you do? You make an ass out of you and me. Well, considering that I'm an ass man, that sounds great. It wasn't Eddie. It was actually a former teammate of mine that got burned. And I didn't even remember what getting burned was until we started talking about this episode. But I remember him telling me something about like, when he went to the doctor, he got like a, there was a swab and a hammer, something mm. going up the tip of his, you know what, and smashing it to get the pus out. Needless to say, after that, I was like, you know what? Condoms aren't that bad. Why can't you just, I would just wear rubber all the time. I know because that, the swab and the pus it just sounds awful. Yeah. Here's Josh talking about wearing a rubber all the time. You're making me think about the Morton salt girl, just like a little, <laughs> a little piece with a raincoat on a salt container. Yeah. That's right. Let's talk about the Morton Salt Girl. I actually know something about this. I don't know why I know something about this, but I know. I know that their slogan is, when it rains, it pours. There's several jokes in that already, just talking about what we talked about. What's crazy is prior to 1911, salt was clumpy, which coincidentally was the name of my guinea pig in third. No, 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 I'm just kidding. His name was Zoltan, and I miss his squeaks. Anyway, salt prior to 1910, it was sticky and clumped together when it was humid or raining outside. And so when you cooked it, you had to chisel it apart. And the, Mor the Morton Salt Company came up with a new free-flowing salt by adding a non-caking agent made of magnesium carbonate to its salt. And it worked. Although today's salt contains calcium silicate as a non-caking agent, the original magnesium carbonate was a breakthrough for the table salt industry. And I know you understand that, Eddie, so don't give me those faces. You're just as much a nerd, if not more. You know, for me, the funny thing about all that is uh, when I was in sixth grade, my science teacher, uh, just to set the mood here real quick, our middle school, the middle school I was in, was basically a prison. It was built like a prison. It was a concrete structure. It did not have any windows. And the science class was in one of the interior rooms. So the science teacher wanted to get our attention. And so we were going to do chemistry. He closes the door. He turns off the lights. It is pitch black. And I'm here thinking like, man, if I get I'm about to start swinging. Anyways, there's suddenly this really bright light from the front of the room. And it's because the teacher had lit up a strip of magnesium. And it, the whole room got incredibly bright, like if the lights were on. And then it went dark again and he turned the lights back on and he's like, that's magnesium. And when you light it up, it creates these really bright, incredible sparks because it's forming a chemical reaction and mixing with other stuff that's in the air. It's why fireworks are so bright. So you're talking about magnesium in the salt and I'm, I'm just here thinking like fireworks. Yeah, I'm hey, thinking listen. like hypertension and my high blood pressure. But 
let's get back to penicillin and how it was discovered. Picture it. The year was 1928. Mickey Mouse had his first shining moment as a really horrible steamboat captain in Steamboat Willie. Have you guys ever seen that? I... So creepy. Uh, steamboats belching plumes of smoke out and it's like disregard for the environment, but whatever. Here, neither here nor there. But besides Mickey Mouse in 1928, the world's first trans Pacific flight is taken. Harvard professors invent the iron lung. And Pedro Flores, a Filipino immigrant to the United States, opens the Yo Yo Manufacturing Company in Santa Barbara, California. How this guy figured out the world needed yo-yos to the point of building an entire factory uh, is just crazy. So some pretty monumental stuff is happening in science and entertainment. But 1928 also brought Sir Alexander Fleming, a Scottish researcher that is credited with discovering something amazing. While halfway through an experiment with bacteria, Fleming decided that his experiment could wait. And what he really needed to do was take a two week vacation. I mean, don't we all? But in what seems as a very unscientific move, Fleming left a dirty Petri dish in the lab sink. When he got back, he found bacteria had grown all over the plate, except in an area where mold had formed. As a result, that discovery led to two things. One, penicillin. Two, Fleming is a dirty b and probably would go out and have tons of sex without getting burned like my former high school teammate. But don't take my word for it. This is what Fleming had to say about his amazing discovery. One sometimes finds what they're not looking for. When I woke up just after dawn on September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic or bacteria killer. But I guess that's exactly what I did. Uh, get in my belly. Your Scottish brogue sounds like it got burned. How dare you? So during the Great War, the war to end all wars, they would use antiseptic, which sometimes was more lethal than not receiving any treatment. All right, just imagine, I don't know, let's talk about like hydrogen peroxide, which we all grew up using. You cut yourself wide open, your intestines are popping on the beach, and they pour hydrogen peroxide all over you, and it starts burning up everything. That doesn't sound very useful. It does nothing. So most people don't know you shouldn't put hydrogen peroxide on your wounds, even though it does have some antiseptic properties. The problem is it doesn't just kill the bad bugs. It also kills you eventually. So hydrogen peroxide was first discovered in 1818 by French chemist Louis Jacques Denat. It was first used commercially to bleach hats. Now, that's not to say that the germ-destroying properties of hydrogen peroxide aren't legit because, again, it does have some applicable use for, like, small cuts and stuff like that. It's just that when you clean your wound with it, you're causing your skin tissue to be damaged in addition to the germs you're trying to kill in the first place. It's just, it's counterproductive. So your skin is corroded by this stuff, and it's, it can actually slow down and even screw up your healing in such a way where you end up with scar tissue where you might not have... So what about bleach or UV lights? Yeah, I mean, that sounds real Trumpy. I don't I don't think that works. What about Mercurochrome? 80s and 90s kids really want to know. I, I think Mercurochrome is probably still OK. It's up there, right, with like Vicks Vapor Rub, the cure all. The Latino delegation agrees. So here's a fun fact. Before Alexander Fleming experimented with penicillin, Ernest Duchenne, a medical student way back in 1897, was told by stable boys that if saddles were stored in a damp, dark, and moldy place, it would protect the horses from getting sores underneath their saddles, because that was a thing, apparently. It also protected riders from groin infections. So it turns out penicillin has been protecting our franks and beans for a lot longer than we knew. Apparently, these writers were getting burned, too, and Duchenne published a paper on this, but then died of tuberculosis, which is not curable by penicillin! <laughs> and so his work was largely ignored as a result, because it's like, how is this thing going to be a cure-all? Dude died from something that was useless. Well, well, this kind of sets the stage for Fleming. Now, I know we hailed this guy as a genius and savior of stable boys, but... Do you know how incredibly dirty you have to be to leave out a, a, a damn dirty Petri dish? I know he changed the course of history, but talk about being reckless and 
as we all know, this is how Planet of the Apes and the zombie apocalypse starts. Some genius steps away from their lab. Something inevitably starts growing or oozing from leftovers and kills a ends up being patient zero. And that dude starts munching on people or chimps go crazy and get smart. They decide humans shouldn't be dominant species anymore. And we end up with the movie. What's the movie I'm thinking about? Planet of the Apes. Nope, uh, not Planet of the Apes. Come on. Mean Girls. Nope. <laughs> not Mean Girls. Uh, idiocracy. Oh, well, yeah, we've been there for a while now. So we might actually yeah. be there now. Yeah. Not that big about Too it. close to reality. But while Flenning, Flenning, God. Come on, Solomon Grundy. Let's go. <laughs> this thing going. <laughs> so today, Junior. I'm never going to get through this. Uh, but while Fleming was... <laughs> Dookie booty. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> See you, Eddie. <laughs> Did you ever know that you're my hero? Okay, I got it, I got it. <clears throat> stop singing. <laughs> I'm just getting ready. You're gonna mess this up. I'm gonna make fun of I know you. you're you're messing me up. All right, all right, here we go. Whew. Okay, but while Fleming was the one who discovered penicillin, he seemed to get bored of it and moved on, leaving the deeper dive into penicillin miracles to Howard Florey and Ernst Chain, researchers at the University of Oxford who were credited with the development of penicillin for use in medicine in mice. What's interesting is that if it weren't for another scientist, Dory Crowfoot, Dory, Dorothy. <laughs> Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Uh, if it weren't for another scientist, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin taking a massive interest in penicillin, Florian Chain would have been a freak without a paddle. Crowfoot Hodgkin used a technique called X-ray diffraction to study the structure of molecules so that she could meet the heavy demands of the military and civilian population because, let's face it, there's no bigger time for the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases than shore leave. Keep your raincoats on, sailors. Because at this point in time, the only successful real-world use of penicillin had been to treat one patient with streptococcal septicemia in the United States in 1942. And let me just tell you this, if you don't know what that is, you don't have to know what it is, except it's awful. So one person gets better, which is awesome, but it's one guy out of tens, hundreds of thousands of people. So they only had a small amount of this stuff at the time and the demand for more of it was just overwhelming. So this incredible woman ends up working out of the Natural History Museum basement and she's trying to figure out the structure of the penicillin molecule. All right, hold on a second. Let's let's just stop and talk about something. So this woman, super impressive, right? Tenacity, determination, she's figuring out some stuff that's going to save the world. But the part that we're sort of glossing over is that she worked in the basement of the Natural History Museum. Now, do you know how creepy it must have been? I I, I know you guys have seen the movie The Relic, Penelope Ann Miller, Tom Sizemore, uh, I'm sure there's somebody else, Linda Hunt, and uh, it's about this homicide detective who's trying to help this anthropologist destroy this South American god monster on a people-eating rampage, and where is it? In the Chicago Museum of Natural History. Now, it's mostly in the basement, sometimes above. Yeah, I, I do remember that movie, um, but the one that was like my favorite was uh, Mimic. The one with uh, Mira Sorvino and Josh mm -hmm. Brolin. Just the thought of giant cockroaches in the subway <laughs> snatching people was just like crazy to me. But that's that has to be one of my favorite movies. My mind immediately went to Night at the Museum because, yeah, I saw The Relic and I saw uh, Mimic. I saw those in the theater when they came out. But there's something about Rami Malek as a fictional Egyptian pharaoh not even the pharaoh himself but like a wax dummy that turns real that scared the hell out of me that was terrifying yeah he he has that like serial killer look no matter what he does like i mean he, just... he killed james bond spoiler alert this yeah is but who's scarier 
Rami Malik or Tom Sizemore in Black Hawk Down? I mean, that to me, that guy is pure terror. Uh, I'll tell you what, Tom Sizemore on uh, Sunset and Ivar with the thousand yard cocaine stare is probably the scariest <laughs> version of him. Oh, rest may he rest in peace. <laughs> uh, listen, Tom Sizemore going outside getting his mail is the scariest Tom Sizemore ever. But this story isn't over. When World War II broke out, the need was so great for penicillin that the mold that it was grown on became so highly sought after. So where do you get a ton of mold easily? Where else? Moldy cantaloupe melons from Peoria, Illinois. It turns out the melons mold pretty easily in the right conditions. And so this woman who was a lab worker, she'd go around to the local grocery store and ask to buy the spoiled rotten melons as a way to grow the mold needed to incubate the penicillin. But it was Dorothy Crawford Hodgkin's lymphoma, just kidding, uh, continued to work and the help of Cross Atlantic team paired with some IBM supercomputers that push things to the finish line. And in 1949, first of all, we're talking about 1949 and IBM has supercomputers. Like that's crazy. But a supercomputer back then basically looked like a cash register out of <laughs> King Supers, you know, just a bunch of paper with holes in it. Right. But by the end of the war, US companies were making 650 billion units a month. And at this point, penicillin is the most widely used antibiotic in the world. All right, folks. That's it for this episode of In the Name of Science. We have tons more creepy and off the rail discoveries to talk about. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe and share. And remember, if it ain't weird, it ain't science. Stop. Grover says, Eddie is an idiot. <laughs>